Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with another Victober video. And today's video is all about The Penny Dreadful, uh, which is kind of a genre of fiction that came about during the Victorian period and was extremely, extremely popular for a period of about 50, 60 years. I first became familiar with the concept of A Penny Dreadful, I think probably like many of us, through the show Penny Dreadful with Eva Green. I never knew that was the term that was used for some of these novels, and so that was kind of eye-opening to me. That show uses the term Penny Dreadful kind of loosely and applies it to nearly all horror from the Victorian period. When some of the things that were included on that show I don't think would ever have been termed a Penny Dreadful, but last year during Victober, I wanted it to be one of my goals to try a Penny Dreadful. I wound up reading two actually, which was really incredible, and I really, really enjoyed it. In fact, I really enjoyed the format. I really enjoyed how the stories were told, and since then I have read a couple more Penny Dreadfuls, and it's just a format that I found I really enjoy. So I thought this year I would do a video dedicated to the Penny Dreadful, and I could talk about some of the ones that I have read, but I could also kind of just give y'all a background of what a Penny Dreadful is. At its heart, a Penny Dreadful is just cheap serial fiction. More specifically, it is cheap popular fiction, but this kind of goes hand in hand with the movement around serialization, which was really popular during the Victorian period. A lot of novels were serialized, which is that they were published part by part, and you would read one part a month when it came out. Penny Dreadfuls are very much the same way. The main difference between a Penny Dreadful and just a regular novel that's getting serialized is that a Penny Dreadful can go on for a very, very long time. There's often no end in sight. You often feel like that, though, with a lot of serialized novels. But the main difference to the consumer of the Victorian period would have been their price. The Penny Dreadful is called the Penny Dreadful because it literally cost a penny for one of these pamphlets. Here in the States, we had an equivalent to the Penny Dreadful, and that would have been the dime novel. So these were novels that cost a dime. Nine times out of ten, these were set out west. And so that's kind of where the birth of the Western came from. Nine times out of ten, a Penny Dreadful would have featured something very sensational, probably something supernatural or something about crime. It may feature detectives, it may feature highwaymen. That was typically the subject matter for most Penny Dreadfuls. And a lot of really popular characters were birthed in Penny Dreadfuls. So we have Dick Turpin. Dick Turpin is such an interesting one. I would really like to read the Penny Dreadful that is based on him. I still haven't. But Dick Turpin is actually a person who lived. He is a real highwayman but he inspired a Penny Dreadful that went on for thousands of pages. He was a very, very popular character from Penny Dreadfuls. We also have Sweeney Todd, who I think is probably the main character that most people know today, who was birthed from a Penny Dreadful. We know a lot about Sweeney Todd today because he features in a really famous musical that was also made into a film. I love Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd is one of my favorite musicals of all time. So I was really excited to learn kind of where he came from and that was in A Penny Dreadful. We also have Barney the Vampire. We'll get there. Yes, this is my favorite and it is in fact one of my favorite Victorian novels. But I would say Barney himself probably not that famous unless you're really into vampire fiction. I think he probably does have some name recognition for you. But if you're not, Barney as a character is maybe not as famous as other vampires, but a lot of what was present in Barney the Vampire as a story was very influential on other vampire fiction, specifically the Fang. We also have spring -Heeled Jack, which is something I had genuinely never heard of before looking into this for this video. And I found some interesting covers that featured spring -Heeled Jack on the British Library website. I had never in a million years heard of this. But this is a really interesting one because actually spring -Heeled Jack really became an urban legend and people claimed to have seen him around London up until the early 1900s. People were still claiming to have spotted him. Again, his Penny Dreadful kind of moving up my TBR a little bit because I just think that's fascinating. I think he had eyes like fire or something and that is what most people claim they saw was some guy walking around with fire coming out of his eyes, which is just genuinely incredible. The Penny Dreadful really started being published in the 1830s and it took off. It became massively popular. 
by around the 1850s, 1860s, there were around 100 publishers who were exclusively publishing Penny Dreadfuls, and more than a million copies of these periodicals were sold per week at their height. I think this is a really interesting number to have because it's telling me that there must be so, so many Penny Dreadfuls that we know nothing about that have basically been lost to the sands of time because I think when you search a Penny Dreadful and you search for some titles, you come up with the same few again and again and again. But this number tells me, especially the number of publishers, that there were so many more out there that must be lost. There are really two genres that birthed the Penny Dreadful. That is, of course, the Gothic novel of the late 18th, early 19th century. I think that's pretty obviously an influence on the Penny Dreadful. But the other is the crime broadside, which would have been sold at a public execution. A broadside is just a single sheet of paper. It would have had information about the criminal that was being executed, but broadsides could have just in general been posters that they posted around. These were incredibly popular in the 19th century. I can't stress to you enough how popular it was to go to an execution. These things in combination with just a much higher literacy rate that really contributed to the popularity of the Penny Dreadful as a format because it was so, so cheap. So something was going on in the Victorian period, both in the UK and also here in the States, where there was just a literacy boom. It was becoming much easier to learn to read, and it was something that was happening across all classes. So 100 years earlier, the upper classes may have been able to read, and they were probably reading quite frequently, but the working classes definitely were not. During the Victorian period, period, the working classes were becoming literate at a very fast rate. And so it became imperative to have a form of fiction that really catered to them. When it came to picking out what you wanted to read as a working class person, you could pick up, say, uh, the new installment in a Charles Dickens novel that was being serialized, or for a much cheaper price for that penny, you could pick up a Penny Dreadful. And so that's basically where the popularity of the format came from. But Penny Dreadfuls, of course, coming from the background of a crime broadside and gothic novels, they were very lurid, they were very sensational, they're very over the top, over dramatic. I think there is a reason why we don't talk about Penny Dreadfuls that often today. When we think about the Victorian period and kind of the boom that was going on in terms of novel writing, you don't often hear very much about many of the Penny Dreadfuls. That is because their writing style is so very interesting and I don't think it works very well for a modern reader if I'm honest. But if you're someone who really likes the Victorian period and you really like the Victorian writing style, you might like A Penny Dreadful, but if you're like me and you like stuff that's lurid and sensationalist and maybe doesn't make any sense, then you're in for a good time when you read them. The thing to keep in mind with Penny Dreadfuls, and this is something I really couldn't find a clear answer for, is just how long and sprawling they became. There were plenty of novels that were serialized across the Victorian period, and some of them, you can say, went on for far too long. I'm thinking of a few specific cases, but none of them reached the two or 3,000 pages that the Dick Turpin Penny Dreadful did. And I think a lot of that is down to the popularity. I think if the Penny Dreadful publishers knew something would sell, they would tell somebody to keep on writing it and authorship for a lot of the Penny Dreadfuls is up for debate. They were often probably being written by people in a workshop, in the publisher's workshop, and so someone would pick up where someone else left off, whereas somebody like Dickens, he is really the only one working on this project, and so he probably reaches a point where he knows the end is coming, whereas a Penny Dreadful, they could foist off onto some other writer. All of that makes for really interesting plot developments and character developments in Penny Dreadfuls because there is one instance that really stands out to me in Barney the Vampire. There is a guy who is legitimately one of the main characters in the first 15, 25 chapters. After maybe chapter 30, I think it was, he is referred to, but he is never mentioned again by name. And that always kind of left me scratching my head. There are a bunch of instances like that in all of the Penny Dreadfuls that I've read, clearly where someone kind of dropped a plot thread and it was completely forgotten about. And there's often also a lot of repetition. You'll be thinking, I have read this before so many times. But when you think about how a Penny Dreadful was written and how it was sold, you realize that there needs to be some built-in repetition to remind people of where they are. And also, they're going to print really, really fast. So there's often not the opportunity to go back and correct things, like maybe in Varney the Vampire, they decided they just really didn't want this guy to be a character anymore. But 
there's really no way to go back and edit him out of the earlier chapters because they're already out there in the world. The first ever Penny Dreadful was published in 1836 and it was called The Lives of the Most Notorious Highwaymen, Footpads, etc. Highwaymen in general were really popular characters and themes for Penny Dreadfuls and I have read I think four or five Penny Dreadfuls at this point and I have not read a single one about a highwayman yet so I feel like that's probably what I need to do next. To go back to Dick Turpin, his Penny Dreadful is named Black Bess and I think it's probably one of the more famous ones. I certainly recognized the cover when I was looking this up but I just think this one is really interesting because I think this is the only one that I could find where a Penny Dreadful was clearly based on an actual person but this whole entire thing has to be basically completely fictional. This was really, really popular, Black Bess, and it went on for, I think, 2,200 pages. Something else interesting about the publishing journey of The Penny Dreadful is that, especially early on, when we're really building out of that old Gothic tradition, there were a lot of things just being outright plagiarized and rewritten to be published as Penny Dreadfuls. There were a lot of things like The Monk that was being rewritten. And then it got to the point where even current novels and current writers were being rewritten for the Penny Dreadful audience. And so it would be things like Oliver Twist, but they would change a single letter in the title to be like Oliver Twist. I would be really interested to see one of those because I think that would be kind of funny. The days before real copyright are so hazy and this was no exception. I think this made up a lot of Penny Dreadfuls, especially when they were just getting up off the ground, was just plagiarizing old Gothic works. But I think it's really interesting that even at their height, they were literally plagiarizing bestsellers that were being published at the same time. And you may be asking, where did the Penny Dreadfuls go? Well, they sadly also fell out of fashion during the Victorian period. They had a heyday of around 50 to 60 years, which is really pretty great, all things considered. But by the 1890s, they were falling out of fashion largely because of their subject matter and because they had finally been priced out by cheaper fiction. Children in particular had been reading Penny Dreadfuls, interestingly enough. And the later Victorian period, early Edwardian period, saw just a massive boom in terms of children's literature. And so, what would a parent prefer their child to read? Would it be a Penny Dreadful or would it be something far more tame? There was also a publisher named Alfred Harmsworth who really started putting out periodicals towards the end of the 19th century. And he priced everything at a half penny which is, of course, literally half the price of the Penny Dreadful. And he did this, he said, because he thought the subject matter of Penny Dreadfuls was just a little bit too much. And people started to buy his periodicals over Penny Dreadfuls because they truly did think the subject matter was more respectable. And so that's kind of how the Penny Dreadful finally died out, which is a real shame. Were they great literature? Perhaps not. Were they fun to read? Yes. And basically for me, that's the point. I'm reading to have fun. And I think that's why I have really taken to the Penny Dreadful in the past couple of years, because I feel like I often try to make myself read true classics, let's say. Things that are really giants, that are really instrumental, things that are maybe even considered part of the canon. So I find that I have to force myself to read things sometimes. And there's always a little voice in the back of my head that says, you need to keep going with this because clearly this is great literature. I never promised that I had taste. And when I found the Penny Dreadfuls, I said, this is possibly what I was always intended to be reading. I probably have a lower brow taste than most people on booktube who are reading classics. I don't care anything about the greats for the most part. I'm just here to have fun. And I think the Victorian period was a really great time for that. I love the sensation novel, and so I think it was an easy next step to move from the sensation novel to the Penny Dreadful. So I thought I would talk about three here that I have read, and I would suggest them to you. These three are the ones that I think I have enjoyed the most, and they're kind of where I started. So I started with The Necromancer, and this was written by George Reynolds, I believe. He's far more famous for writing Wagner the Werewolf. Wagner the Werewolf is a really famous Penny Dreadful. In fact, it's probably one of the most famous. And I have never read it. It was originally going to be the Penny Dreadful that I chose last year, but Kate Howe tried to read it and she just could not get through it. And so I told myself, if she didn't like it, there's really no need for me to try. So I went with the Necromancer, which is one that I had never heard of. 
And this is a supernatural thriller. It is about a man who has essentially been killing women across the centuries. I am telling you this book opens with one of the spookiest intros of all time. A skeletal hand literally comes out of the closet to like pull the door to. It doesn't get any better than that. It truly doesn't. What I will say is that this was actually a good entry point for me into Penny Dreadfuls because it really primed me to understand how they are written. They are very, very wordy and they're going to go on for a very long time. This is the one I would say is the most repetitive. The plot being a supernatural person killing women across the centuries. We got a story of each woman that he told across various medieval centuries. And once you had read one version of this happening, you had read them all. After about the third one, I was really tired of that. And so this one did get really repetitive in a way that was not fun to me, but the rest of the book was just such a great ride. Literally Henry VIII is a character in this. It's unbelievable. I mean, truly this is fun. This is the definition of a romp, but I will say it goes on for far too long. Do I recommend this as a place to start? Probably not. Immediately after that, I moved on to Varney the Vampire, which is my favorite Penny Dreadful. And I'm about to say it, I'm about to admit it. Possibly my favorite Victorian novel. I said it, I said it aloud. This is really, really long. I got this unabridged. I do think there are abridged versions of this out there. And from what I have heard, they're very approachable and they don't leave out too much. This was really a great ride. I mean, from start to finish, I did not care when things were dropped, when things were added in. The characters were just so fantastic to me. I honestly cannot believe how much I loved the characters in this. It was laugh out loud funny. There was a vibe to it that kind of reminded me of the great cinematic masterpiece, 1999 Mummy, because there was just kind of a squad of people who were genuinely bumbling fools and I loved it. But this book is carried by Varney, our vampire character, and I'm in love with him. I'll say it. I'm just going to confess it. He proposed to a girl in this book the most romantic string of words that I have ever had the privilege of reading. I would have said yes. She, to her credit, said no because she has stronger morals. But then he immediately turned because he is a vampire and he said, well, then... I guess I'm going to have to kill you since you've rejected me. And that's when I knew I was down bad. This is everything you want a vampire book to be. They're kind of stalking through graveyards at night. They're digging up graves. They're in these haunted churches. And the characterization is just incredible to me. About halfway through, so about 500 pages in, somebody betrays the group. And genuinely, I didn't see it coming. Now, you might say, based on what you know about how Penny Dreadfuls are written, was that intentional? It may not have been, probably not, you know? But for me, it was fun. It was fun that I didn't see it coming, and I had fun all the way through this. I think about this book frequently. Do I think you can start here? Yes, absolutely. I think it's the best, but it is really, really long. Now, the last one that I want to mention is The String of Pearls, which is the Penny Dreadful that introduced the character of Sweeney Todd. This is the shortest Penny Dreadful that I have read, and I think it really spitballed into a series. This must have become very, very popular, and so there were multiple different Penny Dreadfuls that featured Sweeney Todd. This is definitely the one I would suggest you start with. Basically, one, because it's short, but two, because you're possibly familiar with who Sweeney Todd is as a character if you have seen any iteration of the musical. And if you have seen any iteration of the musical, all of the characters are present in The Penny Dreadful, and The Penny Dreadful is very recognizable as one of the storylines in the musical. I think this is a great entry point, but really, if it had been the one that I started with, I don't know that I would have been that interested in carrying on or finding other Penny Dreadfuls. To me, this was the most poorly written of the three that I'm mentioning here today. I didn't think it was that lyrical. I didn't think that it added a lot in terms of atmosphere. That was definitely what the Necromancer and Barney the Vampire had going for them. They knew how to create an aesthetic, which I don't necessarily think the String of Pearls did. I think I was moving through the String of Pearls based on my love of Sweeney Todd. That was really propelling me forward. But I do still think possibly of the three, it's probably the best one to start with. 
But that was my little Penny Dreadful video. I absolutely love them. I have a couple on my TBR this year and I'm really excited to get into them. But I would love to know down below if you have read a Penny Dreadful, if you have any recommendations. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Happy Victober. Goodbye.